welcome. We are the Museum of Food and Drink. My name is Sari Kamen. I'm the Public Programs Manager. Um, we are a museum. Right now we live online. Like most cultural institutions, we have taken all of our programming to the internet. Um, we were just about to open an exhibition at the Africa Center in New York City that was called African slash American Making the Nation's Table. We were one week away from opening that exhibition and then found out, you know, just like everyone else around the world, um, that that's not something that was going to happen right now because of the pandemic. So that is waiting, that beautiful exhibition full of stories about the African American contribution to American food culture is sitting there waiting uh, for doors to open once it's safe. So we hope that you'll join us if you're in New York or coming through whenever that time happens. Um, so like I said, we had other panel conversations in this series, The Takeout. We have one more after this. Our final panel talk in The Takeout series is a week from tonight, Wednesday. That conversation is gonna be about uh, issues looking at food security and food access as they relate to AAPIs um, in the time of COVID. So we hope that you'll join us next week. If you're not signed up for our newsletter, that is the absolute best way to stay up to date with the variety of online programs that we have. For example, Sunday night, we have a talk with Chef Huni Kim and Kathy Irway. He'll be talking about his newest cookbook, My Korea. Um, so I hope you join us for that. We have, like I said, the takeout next Wednesday and then next Thursday we have a virtual Harlem rent party with the amazing uh, Dr. Jessica Harris. She was the lead curator for our exhibition African slash American. Um, Chef Omar Tate will be talking about food. Mixologist Tanya Hopkins will be talking about cocktails during the uh, Harlem Renaissance era. And we have a Broadway performer, Marisha Wallace, who'll be singing some songs from the era. So that's gonna be a really exciting event. So I really hope that you sign up for our newsletter. Just go to www.mofad.org um, to do that and find out about all of our different online programs. Just a couple things to tell you about this evening. Um, if you missed it before, I suggested that you change your Zoom settings to speaker view as opposed to gallery view so that your screen is focused on the speakers that are talking this evening other than lots of um, squares of, you know, people with their cameras off. And um, also please just keep your microphones and your cameras off as well if you're not a panelist. We are recording this. This recording will live on our website on our online, online programming section under the takeout. So Tell your friends if they want to watch this talk, they can go there anytime starting tomorrow. Um, finally, we, have a, we will have a Q&A. That's going to happen at the end of this conversation, and that's going to happen via the chat box. So if you look down at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there's a little uh, icon for chat. So if you just hold your questions during the actual um, panel conversation and then, and then save them, we will have a Q&A the last 25 minutes and you'll be able to chat your questions into that box. So instead of turning your microphones on and speaking, you'll just be able to type them. So if you have a question that comes up, please just write it down and hold it until then. And we'll let you know when the chat box is open so that you can um, start typing your questions. So with that, I just wanna thank you again. This is a really tenuous, uh, difficult time in the United States and the world. And it's really wonderful to be able to find ways to come be in community, support each other, have really meaningful conversations. So I really, really want to thank our panelists for coming together for this conversation and for all of you um, coming from so many different places for joining us. Uh, I'm really, really grateful to be spending my evening with you. So on that note, um, I want our panelists to all introduce themselves. So why don't we start with Eric, if you want to unmute yourself and say hello. Hi everyone, my name is Eric Kim. I'm a food writer, recipe developer, and um, I write a column at Food 52 called Table for One, and I'm uh, writing a cookbook right now. Thanks for joining tonight. Uh, Bettina. Um, hey everyone, thanks for, um, thanks for joining. I'm Bettina, I'm a staff writer at Munchies. Um, so I cover food and culture for Vice. Um, before Vice, I worked at, at, at Culture, which is a cheese magazine. Um, and then I also like freelanced for like the Boston Globe and some other places. Thanks. Priya. Um, hey everyone, uh, my name is Priya Krishna. I am the author of a cookbook called Indianish and I am a writer for the New York Times food section and Bon Appetit primarily. Thanks. Jenny Zhang. Hi, 
Um, my name is Jenny. Um, one of the two Jennies in this panel. Uh, I'm a culture writer. Um, currently, I work for Eater as a staff writer. Um, thanks so much for having me. Thanks. And before I turn it over to Jenny Dorsey, who's going to be moderating tonight, just for those of you who weren't there at the beginning, I just want to remind you to please keep your microphones, your cameras off, and there will be a Q&A at the end. So just hold your questions and you'll be able to chat them at the end. Thank you so much, Jenny Dorsey. Hey everyone, thanks for joining. I'm Jenny Dorsey. I'm a professional chef, a writer, and the founder of a nonprofit community organization called Studio Tao. Uh, we create content and experiences at the intersection of food, art, and social impact. So um, this is an, like a really interesting topic for me. One of the things that my nonprofit had kicked off earlier this year was a series of conversations about tokenization and had put together a toolkit about tokenization in food media. So I'm really excited to continue that conversation and learn more from all the panelists today. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page um, and we have like the same context around tokenization as well as how that fits into appropriation. I'm just gonna first kick off the conversation with a short intro on what we're using for the definition of tokenization today. This, I know we have mixed opinions out about Wikipedia, but I thought this is uh, quite comprehensive and useful. So the definition of token, tokenization on Wikipedia right now reads, the practice of making only a perfunctory or symbolic effort to do a particular thing, especially by recruiting a small number of people from underrepresented groups in order to give the appearance of sexual or racial equality within a workforce, or I think in this context we can add within how they're representing uh, food culture, et cetera. The history of tokenization, um, we're not exactly clear who first started using the term, but it really does date back to the civil rights movement. You'll see that Martin Luther King and Malcolm X both have referenced it in various speeches, interviews, um, and there's been various academic journals and studies that have talked about tokenization over the years. So there's another quote from a 1988 academic journal that I thought was particularly relevant to tonight's conversation. It's from something called Tokenism and Women in the Workplace. Um, the quote goes, the token's marginal status is as a participant who is permitted entrance, but not full participation. Someone who meets all the formal requirements, but does not possess the auxiliary characteristics, such as race, sex, and ethnicity. Consequently, they are never permitted by insiders to become full members, and may even be rejected if they stray too far from the special niche that's been outlined. Before we get into the conversation, I also want to do a quick conversation about uh, tokenization and appropriation. They're obviously very related, and I know there's been a lot of conversations in the food world about both. So as all panelists, when we open up for first, first queue, feel free to weigh in on that as well. Right now, we're using uh, tokenization, I think, kind of within the appropriation sphere, um, and something, the definition we've agreed on so far, at least for tonight, is uh, for appropriation, the adoption of elements of one culture by another, especially in cases where a dominant culture exploits aspects of a minority culture outside of its original cultural context or at the expense of the original culture for personal gain. Cool, so with that, um, thanks for being with me. I'll open with the first question was, if all the panelists can talk about your experiences with tokenization and food media, specifically, why is it harmful? Why was it harmful for you? What the cost benefits you were weighing during that process and what that looked like? Because the sad reality is many times there are benefits to be had to be tokenized. Um, the long-term impact it's had on you. And since in the context of this particular panel, we're all Asian Americans, if there have been instances that particularly related to COVID-19 and the spike of violence against Asian Americans. So anyone feel free to jump in at any point. And also I'll say that, you know, I'm moderating, but if people want to add each, ask each other questions, feel free to do so too. I'm happy to start, <clears throat> I guess in my experience, and I think we as panelists kind of talked about this the other day, it's impossible to kind of talk about tokenization with, without talking about power and who holds it within organizations, I think so often tokenization is sort of the product of an editor in a position of power basically giving an opportunity to a POC and making them feel like they should be grateful for that opportunity 
even if it is tokenizing, you know, for me, um, you know, within the context of like Bon Appetit video, I have been featured countless times in a video where a white person was doing something related to Indian food. And the way it was explained to me was like, well, you're getting these great appearances in video and you should be lucky that you're getting these appearances in video. But there's like this inherent power dynamic that basically means that like, I don't, this is, this is the only option I have. It's either allow myself to be tokenized or give up the opportunity altogether. And I think it was in an article in Grub Street by Nikita Richardson, but Shakira Simley said something along the lines of like, I don't want to talk about diversity and inclusion unless we're talking about equity. So like you can't, tokenization will always exist unless there is like true equity with POC sitting at the head of the table in positions of power. And that's sort of become very clear to me throughout my career. As someone who was a staff editor and is now a freelance writer, um, I feel like it has, tokenization has a lot to do with how um, the person without power feels. And that's something that I've thought a lot about as an editor. Um, at my previous job, we as an editorial team kind of decided to get rid of heritage months um, in terms of our editorial strategy, kind of with the idea in mind that we should be publishing uh, these voices and these writers all year long. Um, at the same time, that first year when I was an editor, I felt very proud of the Asian Pacific American Heritage Month kind of um, temple that I had I had um, organized, and all the stories in there were so individual. And I think there was something about the fact that the narratives were um, not necessarily stereotypical family recipes, they, even though the, the column was called My Family Recipe, these narratives were very um, specific instances in these individuals' lives. And so for me, that month felt really special and I was really proud to publish those stories. But I, and I also think it was important that, you know, these writers ha gave consent, obviously they're, they're paid for their work, but um, they were, it was a, the relationship was, you know, mutual between myself and the writer. And it was a, it was a constant conversation through the editing process. And um, so I think it has to do with how the writer feels. Um, with that said, I think there's a reason why we as a team got rid of the heritage months in terms of how we were packaging things, because it felt that there was a great chance of a writer or a reader feeling like their heritage was tokenized that month. Um, I can go next. I guess for me, I feel like the main way tokenization has sort of like played a role in my food writing career has been that like tokenization to me was sort of like my way to get in the door. Um, you know, like my first clip was about Filipino food um, because it felt like, you know, I didn't feel like I had a lot of writing experience, but that was something that I was like more familiar with. And I definitely was more familiar with it than like you know, what seemed to, like, it seemed like, you know, compared to the white writers who were in Boston at the time, for example. So I thought that was sort of my way to be able to write something that I, like, actually understood. Um, so in a way, I thought, like, at first I saw tokenization as, like, beneficial to be the token um, and to sort of keep writing about Filipino food, which were most of my, like, sort of early clips. Um, but then, you know, I think the, the downside of that is that I also wanted to write a lot of other things that weren't about just Filipino food. And obviously, you know, not every website just wants a lot of stories consistently about Filipino food. Like, unfortunately, there is sort of like, it does, there is, a, even if there isn't like explicitly a cap on that type of content, you know, I, I still feel like, I feel like there is a cap. Like, I feel like how much can I push, um, you know, that type of stuff, even if that's what I want to do. So I feel like the thing that I'm constantly like weighing is like, what is like, the feel like the benefits are to, of tokenization are that I do have a platform to sort of talk about my food um, and, you know, I feel like I'm glad that people writing about Filipino food are Filipino. Um, but then I feel like the downside of it is sort of thinking about, like, the, the potential to be tokenized in a way that, like, pigeonholes you. Um, and so that's always the sort of thing that I'm trying to balance. Like, how much do I want to write about that versus go elsewhere? 
Yeah, I'll jump in here. Um, I think that sort of uh, entry point that Latino is talking about is very much a reality, um, especially for people of color or we saw like in the personal essay boom for like women who are willing to, you know, write personal essays about, um, in any case, like marginalized people, like willing to share their traumas or talk about these very personal stories. Um, and that was, and still continues to be in a lot of ways, the, the main pathway into this sort of uh, industry, I think. Um, and that is, uh, good I guess for those who can manage to get in this way but overall it's I think like very unhealthy for uh, just the the state of like POC or marginalized writers within this industry um, like what Eric was saying about these sort of dedicated heritage months they're totally a celebration of diverse voices but also the trap is like this is then could become the only potential um, you know opportunity for any of these stories to surface instead of making them a legitimate form of storytelling or bringing in those voices uh, every single month. And people do stand the risk of it getting pigeonholed. Um, even for myself, like I feel very fortunate in that I don't think, I, I don't feel like I face, um, you know, very explicit uh, cases of tokenization for my employer on a personal basis, but there's always a sort of larger pressure within food media, food journalism as a whole, like, um, I see that people love the stories about, you know, Asian identity or like, uh, my Asian grandmother's cooking and stuff. And, and then this sort of like outside pressure to, to feel like I have to provide that in order to get any attention, gain any attraction, or even make a career for myself. Yeah, jumping off that point, if, um, if you want to talk a little bit about this idea of always framing up stories from people of color in a certain context, uh, like what you were saying, Jenny, this idea of like my grandmother's recipe, that's what people want to see. And so because you're put in that, you know, scenario, you kind of keep churning out recipes, you keep assigning those uh, stories to writers, and then the cycle continues. So how do we kind of, what do we do with that? Like, how do we expand that notion? Is it getting more people? Um, we'll talk a little bit about disrupting the system and how we can dismantle it. But like, how do we even, wh where we are now, how do we even change that framing in people's minds when they are reading uh, stories from people of color? I'll say something about, so when I think about those heritage months, um, uh, like the Asian one, for instance, Asian Pacific American Heritage Month, I, I did a call for pitches. And what that helped me do was meet new writers, um, writers who had never been into my inbox. And so what ended up happening was even though um, that initial call maybe produced some stories that um, were part of a personal narrative that are um, stereotypically um, a genre for POC narratives, um, what happened after that was these writers, um, many of them who were just starting out in their career. Um, so like, you know, this, this pattern we're, we're talking about, this, this is exactly how it happens. But in, in, in this experience, in this instance, I do think it helped, um, it helped them to like, when you get your foot in the door, you know, and then once I saw their writing, um, I wanted to work with them more. Um, I feel like I keep talking about myself as an editor, but it would be helpful to talk about myself as a writer. But for me anyway, it was, it's, it's almost like easier to write that first essay about your, your mom's dish or your grandma's food, um, because you don't feel like you're an authority on it yet. What happened after that though, was once I started writing about other nuances in my family's cuisine um, and their culture, um, I kind of gained this confidence and that's something that is uniquely for me, and I, I definitely agree with you, Jenny, that there is, um, there is a manipulation or a, um, a dangerous kind of, um, like taking advantage of young writers, you know, uh, personal stories. But for me, I, I feel like I was able to find this genre that let me do um, so many other things, um, like in a memoir or in, a, in an essayistic piece, um, I'm able to 
explore um, not just my family's history, but you know what life in Atlanta was like in the '80s for for um, Korean immigrants, um, for instance. And so, so in that instance, um, there is something about that genre that I think is uh, it, as long as the writer can move on from that first piece, um, there is like there's a there's room to grow. Um, but that's yeah, that's one instance in which. I mean, th I think jumping off of that, like sort of talking about like, you know, writing about our family's experiences and foods feels like our, you know, the thing that feels the most, we have the most expertise in. I feel like one aspect of tokenization that I think is really harmful is sort of the way you internalize it because it feels like, you know, to me, it feels like I have the most expertise in like my family's Filipino adobo or whatever, right? But like I grew up in Pennsylvania in the suburbs. So like, if you think about it, I actually do have as much experience with like going to Red Lobster or like, uh, you know, McDonald's, but for some reason it doesn't feel like those things are things I can like lay as much claim to. If, but if I'm speaking from like the perspective of, of authority when it comes to food writing. Um, so I feel like that's just, you know, it is nice to have that, that like immediately familiar thing to, to get our foot in the door, but also I think we should sort of interrogate why we see that thing as being the most familiar, especially if we're Asian American and we've had such like these extremely mixed backgrounds. I also think one thing that's so difficult is because there are so few of us in visible positions within food media, I think sort of we're subject to like an immense amount of pressure from our own communities. You know, I grew up in an Indian American household. My experience is my own. Um, my recipes are my family's, but you know, every time I would present a version of this recipe um, to like online, inevitably there were the like, this is not how my nani used to make it. This is not how my daddy used to make it. Like sort of as communities of colors, color, we have sort of like our own communities like breathing down our necks because they are so starved for representation. And there is no way that like a singular person can represent like, an experience that is the opposite of a monolith like for me like Indian cuisine is just like it's unbelievably nuanced and varied and my version of it is so 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 specific and I try very hard to emphasize like I am not an expert on Indian food nor does my experience represent the experience of all Indian Americans in this country but it's but it's but it's very hard um and you feel sort of this competing pressure to at the same time, represent your community and educate people outside of your community about your community while also like not upsetting your community or making your community feel like you are a good representative of them, especially when you are given such a large platform. And on top of that, you're dealing with mostly white editors who are trying to kind of whitewash your food and pre present it in a way that they think is palatable for, for white people, you know, calling a dish, you know, I gave this example of this dish, Gardi, just unbelievable dish of like chickpea flour, yogurt, turmeric. It's not a soup, but for SEO purposes, like on the Bonnerty website, it's classified as a soup. And you get all these messages being like, how dare you call it a soup? And I'm just like, I'm just glad that there's a Cardi recipe on Bon Appetit in the first place. And I think that pressure can be, can be, can be really hard to navigate. That makes me think of kind of two sides that I would love to get into and hear. We talked a little bit about this on our, our pre-call is one is this idea of because of tokenization, the scarcity of people of color representation never goes away. Now that I'm the one Chinese person on staff, they're done. Like, we're good. We don't ever need another East Asian. And same goes for most, you know, other categories of color. And then with that, this quota system, which we have essentially implemented, not just in food media, but in across multiple industries as a way to stave off, you know, uh, complaints about lack of diversity. So then we have quotas on what we need to hit. Like, what is the efficacy of that? Thoughts on how do we combat both of those things in a way as we work towards equity? And I think one really important thing to acknowledge, especially for 
um, you know, Asian writers or, you know, specifically writers from like Asian communities that are typically more affluent and more visible, um, you know, myself included, Chinese American or East Asian. Um, like sometimes when you're in, you know, an organization or just like within this whole uh, sphere, like when people are thinking about diversity, um, like they will count you as like a diverse person, I guess. But um, often, like we, we totally have to acknowledge that um, maybe that's, you know, you become the token or the standard for diversity. Um, and maybe like an organization doesn't have to focus so much on having black writers or having like indigenous writers or people from like Latinx backgrounds. Um, so that's like one thing that I'm really aware of, um, especially as we talk more about, you know, the specific needs that different communities have and how the label people of color can be so inadequate when you're talking about literally like so many ethnicities and races and even within the term like Asian American um there there there's just a huge um sort of flattening that happens when we talk about this so um but it, it does feel like a it is like a scarcity problem a representation problem like until that there is like more room for just like the the majority of people to be made up of um perhaps like non-white people this is gonna keep happening um and it sucks. Do you think realistically there is a way to combat tokenization without overhauling the, basically all the white male editors at our food media publications today? Because as we've seen in the wake of Black Lives Matter, everyone has their, you know, we're gonna champion diverse media now, we're gonna do this. Obviously there's been a big shakeup of Bon Appetit, but, what about the New York Times of the world? What about Food and Wine? What about all those other places? Fundamentally, can a, a white editor with white supporting staff champion these ideals in an equitable way, or do we need to demand that people of color represent um, ourselves at an executive level? That, for sure, <laughs> um, in my opinion. I think, um, I think when I when I think about um, diversity, I always think about this one thing that Corsha Wilson said. We were on a diversity panel um, for the food writing forum, and she said, um, "I don't want a seat at the table." And I think there's something about um, that table that needs to be dismantled. It needs to be a new table. It needs to be um, a new a new a new masthead um, because. There is again. It's it's about power, and um, there's already going to be inequity if someone is inviting you to the table. It should be a new table, um, and I think until that happens, um, everything is just going to kind of stay the same. Because we've we've seen that the quota system doesn't work. It's uh, you know, we are all as um, people who have been on staff at publications going to be counted as the diversity quota. And um, I can't speak for everyone else, but I just don't think. Um, I still think even as much as I tried to change things in these institutions that I worked at, I think there was, um, I think it, it, it's impossible for um, for individuals to do it. It has to be a systemic change. Yeah, Bon Appetit literally had quotas for recipes, for social media, for every aspect of the brand. But like, even when those quotas were sort of just met, like, instinctively it did not feel like anything had changed. It felt like quotas were met, but there was no cultural shift, no systemic shift away from this white centered narrative that had dominated the publication for so long. And I think that like the shakeup that, that did happen was so unbelievably necessary because the, the system of sort of, of white centered power was just so, glaringly dominant that it required I think a, a, a massive change yeah I agree with that um and I think it goes beyond like any one single editor or staffer as I think Eric was saying um it's like an unfortunate reality that uh the way that media is set up like they're 
which is like media does not make a ton of money, um, especially for people who are sort of in the lower to mid tiers. Um, as long as that happens, as long as that there are these like economic pressures and we are in this like wider sort of situation, um, there's always going to continue to be like a centering of like a white middle class or like upper middle class audience. Um, what people, what you know, people in power think the audience wants. There's going to continue to be like exploitation of labor. Like people are going to continue to get paid almost nothing, especially when they start out um, in this industry. So it, it's like food media, but also beyond food media into media in general, and beyond that into like I don't I don't know society in general. I don't really know what the the answer is except for like a complete overall like dismantling of just like how I guess like this capitalist uh like ethnocentric system works which um is a pretty big big ask for just some some writers and free media. For places that have at least done some let's say bond activity places that have moved and shuffled around so that there's more hopefully more people of color joining you know their major mass heads how do we combat this issue of like centering the white gaze because that's not a problem exclusively to white people either and i i'm totally guilty of it because you just get so ingrained in knowing what uh the white gaze looks like and it may immediately appealing to it i don't want to call out the public that i just worked for but you know i remember there was a cognizant shift when I started writing just I knew that the audience was different I knew it was me white women you know and you're adjusting yourself you're kind of self-policing before the editor even goes through it so how do we change that internal mentality how do we change that in the workplace and then how do you shift I really realize this is a lot of questions but then how do you shift your audience to recognizing that you know what maybe you as the white person in the audience Maybe this article isn't doesn't center you and what you know and what you're familiar with, and making that the most. I mean, frankly, and I feel like I feel like I'm in a very lucky position to say this because I've had editors who are very like flexible with letting me do things. But I think it is just sort of being able to like carve out space at, to write things where you're purposely not centering my audiences. You know, like. I have definitely written things where I'm like, this is clearly just for Asian American. Like the only people who really care about me getting like into this depth are Asian American people. And like, honestly, I've been very lucky to have editors who were sort of just like, yeah, that's fine. Like it's not every piece. Like I think we have to acknowledge that not every piece is going to be for everyone. And like not necessarily having the standard that everything is gonna be universal because like, frankly, it isn't. And if we always shoot to make things like universal and you consistently just like water down the conversation because you're always trying to get to like whatever the like most accessible entry point is. And sometimes you just wanna talk about the niche thing that is like, you know, not everyone's gonna get it. And I think that's just something we need to move towards as an industry. We're just like expecting more of the reader. Like I noticed that when I read novels, oftentimes dishes are not explained. They're just presented as, as, as fact. And you know, if you wanna know about the dish, you can Google it or you can look it up. And I hate all the times I've been asked to put like, like pakora, parentheses, spiced fritters in an article and it drives me crazy. And it got to the point where I was like, I don't do parentheses and I don't italicize like, non-white dishes like this is just a rule that i just hold myself to and i think like the more that we as poc can like expect more of our readers and challenge our readers and also it, while also assuming that not every person reading this is a white reader i think i think that the, the better you'll be like i don't think i don't think it's a big i don't think it's i don't think it's doing a disservice to the reader to drop the name of a dish that they may or may not know i think i think i really love narratives that like center the author i think it's much richer and and much more engaging um and i yeah i feel like i think about this now every time i i write about a a dish like from my upbringing for example like why should i have to explain myself why should i have to assume that the person reading this doesn't know what I'm talking about. And it's the same thing for recipe head notes too. Yes, I, from the perspective of an editor, um, I feel like I've been an editor longer than I've been a writer, but 
Um, <laughs> I think it was always when we put out stories that um, non-white narratives that had maybe never been written about in a traditional publication. Um, and those recipes specifically, th those were inst the instances in which the audience, um, especially at these institutions, which are very white, um, their ears were like peaked. They kind of, um, those performed, you know, often just as well as, you know, a three ingredient pasta or something. Sometimes that three ingredient pasta wouldn't do well. And we'd be like, oh, we're like, we're assuming that the readers is vanilla and dumb. Um, but I think, I think the more editors uh, take risks um, and just acknowledge that if you present this a, a dish that doesn't, if you present a dish that's never been written about, chances are your reader, your readers will be very interested because they've never, they've never heard about it. And I think the more that editors um, feel empowered to publish a thing like that, um, especially brown food, because um, brown food tastes the best. Um, I, I almost want to go into a conversation about food styling because that's it's a big part of our, our industry um, that no one talks about the racism there. But I think um, the more people just recognize that food and experience in America is diverse, the more um, it will start to look that way on the page. And the more it looks like that way on the page, the uh, less um, kind of pushback everyone will get. Eric, can I have you talk about food styling? I was going to bring that up now that we're, we are kind of talking about this in general. How do we get to a place? It's about showing that everyone is unique. Everyone has a specific take on their own life, the culture that they relate to in a different way. So many times we are, when we talk about tokenization, we're always talking about text, but there are many aspects of visual food culture that we overlook. And many times there are things that are tokenized in that sense you always see Chinese food with chopsticks. Does every Chinese food can eat with chopsticks all the time? I, I don't, I don't know. Like, does that make me not Chinese? So yeah, if you could talk a little bit about your experiences with that, or everyone can talk about it. I know Eric, you had a particular experience and how, how to combat that, how to work around it, how to also keep open people's eyes to it. Food selling so tough. I don't have the answer to it, but I do think it should be on the food stylist um, to do their research and to kind of be empathetic humans and kind of learn about the dish or the culture that's on the page. And as an editor, um, it works differently for every publication, but it's usually the editor's job to kind of provide context and to provide styling notes. Um, and I just think, um, I th like, I don't think the answer is that a Chinese person has to style Chinese food. Um, even though there's a reason I, I made sure that my entire creative team for this cookbook that I'm writing is, um, is Asian. Um, because there's just, um, I, even though I, I did that, um, I don't think that a food sauce has to style the food of their culture. But what needs to happen is um, a level of like understanding that their, their, their viewpoint will be, um, if a white food sauce food viewpoint might be, um, you know, centered from a white perspective, which is, seems obvious, but um, I think, as long as we all relinquish that, um, you know, that, that internal bias, it will, uh, it will make the food uh, and give the, give, the, give the art kind of a chance to, to live authentically. I think that will, that will help. Um, Priya, when we did our pre-show call, you also talked about like one of the, uh, it was in your book, one of the styling of how, you know, there's kind of these two extremes of one where something gets mischaracterized and then one where the stylist takes it to the utmost extreme where it's like almost grotesquely that culture, it's like hitting you over the head. Can you just talk a little bit about that too? Yeah, I mean, I was really careful with styling for my cookbook. I didn't want it to feel overtly playing into Indian stereotypes, whether that was like, you know, the there's like that Indian script like that, that people, that Indian, that restaurants use, the sort of royal colors. I wanted to like actively push against those stereotypes. And a lot of that was because um, an Indian recipe of my mom's was used in a cookbook. And I opened the cookbook and <laughs> it was like a picture of the dish that was like a, my mom's like riff on like butternut squash with fenugreek and like ginger and tomatoes. And there were like all these photos of like Hindu deities surrounded by the dish. 
And it was so, I mean, it was just so unbelievably cringy. There was like something there that like had like, uh, like Sanskrit type on it. And it was just like, this in no way like contextualizes or like helps create an environment around the dish. This just like is literally looks like someone like Googled every Indian stereotype or even like typed into like a prop database like Indian and they just pulled everything from that. And it was just, and I, and I see that happen so often, not just with Indian food, but with all sorts of kind, well, all kinds of food where they feel like they have to include certain patterns, certain like, like chopsticks for any Asian dish, like these specific notations of culture where it's like, why is it that like white food is tied to like no culture and non-white food is always tied to like sort of specific cultural connotations? Like why can't my mom's squash dish just be styled in a really minimalist way or styled in a way that's like personal to our experience? I made that for Thanksgiving, by the way. <laughs> My family loved it. <laughs> Those are good examples of why tokenization is like ultimately just like the like the most perfunctory attempt you can get at like acknowledging culture. Um, mm -hmm. Like for example, I think about like when the photographer Celeste Nache has like talked a lot about you know like when they style Filipino recipes, they are on like banana leaves or they serve it with chopsticks. But like Filipinos basically use spoons or like you know, you use like your hands, you, we don't really use chopsticks, but it's sort of like this attempt at being like, hey, look, we did like a Filipino thing. So we, you know, you sort of get the visibility of having like access that culture in some way, but sorry, <clears throat> you sort of get the visibility of like accessing that culture in some way, but not actually thoroughly doing it or like addressing it correctly or representing it correctly. Um, and like, so I don't think that's necessarily means that like everyone in the process needs to cut, like everyone making an Indian cookbook should be Indian, but it sort of does point to the fact that you like need people at multiple layers to be sort of providing that like input and context and like checks and balances and being like, hey, is that really the way we want to do that, you know? On that note, I also want to ask about like when we as POC, whether we're consumers or we're within the organization or we're the person writing, styling, whatever, um, and with our various varying amounts of power, like how do we call out or call in things that we don't agree with? Like, I think we have mixed feelings about call out culture, but it is effective in certain ways. Um, sometimes if you call in and just, you know, tell someone higher up on the food chain, nothing gets done. So thoughts about what we can do within our realms of power to disrupt the system, to hold people accountable? Does it need to be public? Is it worthwhile? At some point, do you turn it from private to public if it's been ignored enough, et cetera? You know, I think Hard question, I know. Yeah, um, but I, I think the typical route of action would probably be to call in first, as you said, Jenny, um, like, is there someone with like you can flag this issue too. Um, will you have support if like multiple people on staff um, feel this way? And then, you know, if there's truly nothing happening there, um, like take to Twitter, like go public, frankly. Um, I think that going public um, and getting the, the support of the audience behind you, which, you know, that's the, that's the publications like bread and butter, they need their audience. Um, we saw in the case of like Bon Appetit, that was like very effective, uh, coupled with, you know, all of the pushes or changes that have been ha happening internally, as we saw from people like Priya um, and other um, people within the organization. Um, and then I'd say like more broadly, also like really like the the trend from that is like to go for like power in numbers. Like it's easy for one person who like always gets called out or always does the calling out, like maybe they will face danger or like risk of, you know, getting fired or just like being moved to like an unfavorable position or something like that. But if you have the the sort of like collective solidarity of your staff um, or your union, if your organization has a union um, or this like collective big pressure of like uh, yourself coupled with the audience or other people within your industry, like that, I guess, is how we are seeing some 
changes, like both incremental and, and bigger. I think what's really important about what you said is what happens when you don't have people to lean on to, you know, be a voice with you. And so that's why I think what happened with Bonap is so exceptional because, um, and what's happening right now um, in our country, I think we're realizing that it, it can't just be on um, the VIPOC people to, um, to speak up all the time. I, I think it has to be everyone in the room. Um, and I think about how, how many times in my career I didn't have that um, from my teammates and how much I wish I had that. Do you think that there's particular things that consumers of media, food media, um, should be doing or can be doing better as we as they encounter tokenization going forward? I mean, I can't even tell you how many DMs I got from people after all of this happened that were like, oh my God, longtime viewer of Test Kitchen videos. I had no idea that this was an issue, but now I realize it's an issue. I personally feel like you only need to watch a couple videos to sort of understand the system at work, the system that was at work in the test kitchen. I, I think it is, it is quite obvious for anyone. And I just think that consumers not only need to like show support with their dollars and their clicks, but I think they like, people need to really think very critically about the type of content they're consuming. How is that educating them? How is that challenging? their beliefs versus reinforcing them. Um, you know, ultimately, a big reason why Bon Appetit was so white-centered is because white-centered shows got views, white-centered shows got promoted, and it was sort of this reinforcing cycle. And if consumers aren't asking for something different, there's no incentive for the higher-ups to do anything different. You, you know, whenever I would bring these issues up with video, I would just get this very clear sense that they thought, white food and white people equals clicks, non-white food, non-white pe people equals fewer clicks. And it like truly is on consumers to provide those clicks to like help challenge and dismantle those systems. It made me think of this like idea of labor and who we assign labor to when we are centering or not centering it's essentially like when we center the white gaze or when we uh not center people of color or essentially saying that people of color you can do all the labor if needed but we will not ever give white people the labor of looking something up because it's already explained for them and why we are so comfortable with with not assigning that labor to anyone um except people of color and yet like look at all the people that spoke up about bon appetit it was all B, B I P O C staffers, like it was one hundred percent that that labor was on them to to speak out. And even now in meetings, like the folks who are really pushing for the big changes are very much a lot of those those same staffers. Um, and I'd like us to think about how non yet B I P O C people can sort of like assume that labor as well because it can't it can't just be on us everyone has to pitch in yeah i think we are seeing that as like this sort of broader cultural moment um at this point in time like like very like love to see it um like all the the protests and like you know even just seeing all these different you know anti-racist like reading lists and like these these books like shoot up in bestsellers um it, it is like a point in time where we are seeing more white people um or non-black people non-indigenous people like kind of take it upon themselves to say like i want to educate myself i want to you know unlearn uh this this sort of like deeply steeped uh, racism that uh, you know, so many people grow up with without realizing it, like even just like the uh, biases or microaggressions that they're not aware of themselves. So yeah, I totally agree that it's like um, change has to happen like from within, but also like the consumers um, have a real voice uh, and everyone should be kind of 
doing their doing their own part in sort of like interrogating themselves, interrogating what they are consuming and what they want to support, um, whether with their clicks or their like subscription dollars, as you said, Leah. Now, one of the things I've read recently, I think it was Washington Post, um, the headline was like, when black people are hurting, white people join book clubs. And I thought that was, you know, particularly, I was really on the nose. Um, so like to that point, Jenny, how do we keep up the momentum around this? Because right now we're having this like boon of like everyone's like, oh, being critical. We're like, oh man, you know, we need to be diverse. But in, in six months from now, in two years from now, how do we ensure that we don't fall back into the same pattern? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it does feel like something like this is more, this like cultural change at this point in time has, feels more um, sort of like long, longer lasting and kind of more pivotal um, than moments before, I think coupled with, you know, all the growing frustrations with inequity across this country and like these, these systems of oppression and abuse um, and, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic on top of everything. I think it's important for um, people, especially those who proclaim to be allies to continue to put in the conscious effort and work to, you know, keep showing up, keep providing support, keep like throwing your dollars where it needs to go. Unfortunately, like so much depends on money in, um, you know, our country and the way that the world is set up, um, like make your donations occurring, um, constantly assess like what you're consuming, who are you, who you're supporting, um, and like hold institutions accountable. Like if we, are not seeing the changes they want from like police departments like how like how can we continue to keep up protests um or you know donations to activist groups to can make sure that they do um affect the changes that we want to see or within the smaller scale of our food media and space like in six months like what does bon appetit look like um uh, what does like xyz other publication look like what's going on um and just like i i guess just like all I ask is that people don't just like forget about this. Um, I don't know that I have like a, a great solution either because I, my go-to response is usually like, let's just, who cares? Like, let's just burn it all down or nothing, none of it is going to work ever. So I don't know that I'm the best person to come up with an idealistic, actionable, uh, you know, to do with. I feel like in the food space, like just like some changes that I'm like personally trying to do and like recommending that my friends do, for example, is like, you know, right now there's a lot of lists of like black chefs and black food bloggers and black recipe developers to follow. Um, and I feel like just part of it is just like actually like instead of just following them now, like still be following those people six months from now and like still sharing their recipes as much as you're doing right now. Like I feel like all of it, you know, because so many people share like the same white recipe developers recipes over and over again and like I feel like we all just need to be more conscious about doing that but sort of a wider like a wider base of people who are creating recipes or writing articles about food and I feel like if we're sort of unhappy about the institutions that we have right now I think we also just like really need to consciously support efforts that are sort of trying to do different things you know like um the For the Culture magazine for example that's like coming out um and like Whetstone magazine like I feel like there are a lot of like small publications that if we actually want to like practice our values we actually need to support those things and like promote them um more consistently than just right now and give them the money so they can pay their writers better so then there isn't an incentivization to not go and work for smaller pubs well yeah and just so they can also just like keep existing you know like i feel like if we are invested in those things we have to actually like financially invest in them yeah, I mean, like paying black writers, paying black photographers, paying black food stylists, hiring them into positions of power. Like these are the only ways to create long term change. Like I you can't just be calling up the one or two black writers, you know, and asking them to write a story now. Like, how do we make those folks part of our permanent Rolodexes? And, you know, one thing that like I have thought about is like you know I try to sell 
stories, diverse stories about folks who I feel are underrepresented, but sometimes I'm not the best person to write the story. And I think like oftentimes lately I've been thinking about like, who is the best person to write this story and how can I use my power as a writer to like empower someone else? Because for all of us on this panel, our voice like means something to the editors and the people that we work with us recommending someone means something. And I think recognizing, even if we're not assigning editors or editors in chief, like we all have a level of power to, you know, empower someone from, you know, the black community, from the indigenous community. And I think like, that's something that I've, I've tried to really think about and, and sit with and like, think about the ways that I need to be doing that a lot more. Yeah, I really, um, I really love that Priya. And just like, again, with the whole like scarcity mindset, like maybe the, before the go-to move would have been like, okay, get to the top, like pull up the letter behind you, you've attained, you've like gotten yours. Um, but again, like with that whole idea of like solidarity, like, it is your responsibility, unfortunately, but also it, it should be um, to to like keep the ladder behind you, to keep trying to pull up people behind you, um, whether that is through like, as Priya said, like giving any, like recommending other people for assignments, um, maybe just like providing contacts, um, like answering questions if people reach out to you and need help. And this is something I'm gonna try to be better about as well. Um, so yeah, like just there's, there's scarcity as long as, you know, the people at the top, like want us to believe there's scarcity, um, but ideally there, there should be enough room for like a, a plethora of voices. And then you also won't see the same issues with like uh, sort of surface level tokenization as well. And disclosing rates too. I've been following the hashtag publishing paid me on Twitter, which has been really depressing um, after some of the stuff I've signed. But so last question is, do you think that this, all of this can be done in the context of how fast our content cycle is right now? Or does that ultimately need to change too? Because part of what's happening, why there's a default of hiring that writer that you know, um, one of the things that we talked about at a salon that we did about this topic was, you know, we wanted to sign um, a story about like a Sal El Salvadorian food oh, well, we just need a Latinx writer, any Latinx writer, the first one we know, let's get that person in the door because we want that story next week versus finding the right person. So do we also need to slow down the content cycle? If yes, how do we do that? Or if not, is there a way to do it without slowing down the content cycle? I think, unfortunately, um, as I maybe sort of alluded to before, uh, the way a lot of sort of like digital media or like mainstream media setup is in such a way that you know there are these sort of like never-ending traffic needs um this this ever-turning content cycle I don't foresee that um ever really getting like fixed or you know quote-unquote fixed um as long as you know these are the business models we're stuck with and that th this is sort of like the pace of publishing um that has just become the norm I don't know how to fix that on a personal level, aside from, you know, again, fixing media as a whole, which I don't know, uh, uh, people who are like way smarter than me or paid way more than me are thinking about that all the time about how to fix that. Um, but maybe like, I don't know, on an editor level or sort of higher level, there are ways to sort of like advocate for more thoughtful um, writing or, or content with longer lead times. Um, but I know that, you know, even editors, they feel immense pressure from their higher ups as well. So I, I don't know, media is not in a good state. I think the thing that is happening right now is editors feel more, um, maybe because they're, they feel urgent about it, but editors are more inclined to reach out to writers they don't know. And that's something that I recognize as a blind spot of mine when I was an editor. And I wish I had done more, but, um, cause you know, you work with the writers that you work with and that you like, but I think, um, I do think editors are starting to reach out more to people they haven't worked with. Um, when I was an editor, we, we used equity at the table a lot, but it, it, lead, it leads back to that same question of kind of feels like tokenization when you reach out to a Salvadorian writer to like write a Salvadorian piece. Um, 
so I don't know. It just, I don't, I don't know that, you know, I have the answer, but I think as long as, um, an assignment comes from a genuine place and, um, if you make sure that the, yeah, I don't know. I think it, it all feels like tokenization. Um, but I, I do still believe that it feels like tokenization if the writer feels tokenized and we talk about how the power dynamic is what makes tokenization tokenization. But, um, I think if the, if the writer doesn't feel tokenized, I don't know. That's not, that doesn't, I don't like where that's going, but, um, yeah. Well, like if the writer genuinely wants to write the story versus you are yeah. assigning to them because. That's their beat. And if that's what they feel like they, they really want to write, but it's hard to know that beforehand. And I've, I've had, yeah, I've had reactions that were completely opposite um, from writers based on just how they personally felt. So I don't know what the answer is. Hi, everyone. Um, great to see you all again. We're going to start the Q&A. So I just first want to thank Jenny. Thank you so much for leading this talk. Your questions are amazing. And thank you all for um, your willingness to be honest and transparent and vulnerable. Um, it's just so interesting because when we started this conversation, it was supposed to be about COVID and the world has changed. I mean, we're, we're still in COVID, but the world has changed over and over. So uh, thank you all for your flexibility and willingness to kind of navigate this conversation in, in different directions. Um, okay, so first question is from Janice. They ask, how do you feel about certain Asian foods becoming trendy, like Korean barbecue, dim sum, blah, 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 and the zeitgeist considering the gatekeepers of most food trends are white. It's great for visibility, but I feel like it allows for people to look past food heritage and past racism, especially when these foods become recontextualized in terms of other foods and cuisines, um, kind of the fusion, kimchi, fries, yakitori, tacos, et cetera, to become more easily accessible to non-POCs. Priya, you, you already kind of touched about this, um, talking about some of your recipes, if you want to kick it off. You're muted. Oh, sorry. Hi. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah cu cuisines aren't trends. Um, I am tired of people saying, like, Indian food, Filipino food, Vietnamese food is having its moment. I'm tired of x is the new y headlines as if there can only be like one like there's only room for like one cuisine as a trend at a time um i honestly wish that i wish that we would like do away entirely with like cuisines as trends because cuisines are not trends they are people's lived experiences and those people have been in america for a really really long time um and i also think like once again the more that you treat something like indian food or a filipino as a trend that in and of itself is the centering of a white narrative and something we see so often in food publications where like the norm normal food is white food and everything else is sort of treated as the other but i think as writers as readers as editors we need to recognize that like everyone is coming at a story from a different normal the the normal can't be white food we need to move away from that does anyone else want to respond before we move on uh, i'll say like i was pitching something the other day and i I kind of was like, you know, I was doing the whole thing at once and I was sending out this pitch about sand ginger as an ingredient. And literally, I'm so embarrassed to even say this right now publicly to all these people, but the first headline pitch that I thought of was like, the ingredient that you need to try now. Like, I just thought that would be catchy. And then I was like, oh my God, what's wrong with me? Um, so then I changed it to like, I wanted to talk, what I really wanted to talk about was sand ginger and how, because I had to learn how to read uh, Chinese or uh, relearn how to read Chinese to distinguish sand ginger from regular ginger. That's the story I wanted to tell. So I think like, regardless of, I guess, right now, we think have gone trendy or has been more in the hot spot more than before. Um, if we, if white writers, right, white editors are more able to like not use terms like new novel discovery, all of that, but instead contextualize it, it very specifically to the person writing it and thinking about it that way. 
and specifically to the food, I think the more specific you get, um, whether in a headline or a recipe title, um, the more the less chance you have of risking like tokenization. Great, thank you. Uh, this is from Celeste. They ask, this is for everyone. What role do you think SEO will play in dismantling current editorial practices? That's a great question. Is this something that could get in the way knowing these platforms are so fixated on the bottom line? I, I'd like, I can answer this because I used to be an SEO manager <laughs> for Food Network. I think, um, I think Google is uh, way smarter than people realize. So, you know, there are, um, there are synonyms and, and what I mean by that is like, it, it isn't necessarily always just like one term, it's like the whole piece. So I think, um, I think editors need to be more informed about what SEO actually means and um, to see the bigger picture because the more you, you know about the way Google runs and it's different every freaking like three months. So the more, I think Google's getting smarter about um, not tokenizing these like certain food stuffs. Okay. For everyone, what are some things you'd love for food media companies to stop doing immediately? I mean, I feel like mine was already touched on, but I would say mine is just the entire premise of like the introducing people to things uh, like story format, like, you know, that you've probably like presuming that you've never tried something before or that people have never heard of it before. You know, I think that we should just move away from ever saying that something is the new other food. You know, I think that's just a very tired construct and the, there are so many other ways to talk about things that aren't that way. I had this happen to me today um, with a food media outlet where I shot a video with them last year and um, I purposely made a dish that was like not Chinese inspired, not Asian inspired, like had like orange blossom, water and um, like, you know, lead man, anyway. Um, and somehow in the video, there was still like, and her Chinese American heritage plays into this and like dragging it into the spotlight, even though it's not relevant. So I think that's a big thing is like, we never, we don't contextualize a white writer, like, and they're from Wisconsin, like every time that we see their name pop up. But so why does Chinese American constantly have to be around my name? It's not that I don't want to be Chinese American and be seen that way, but it's not always relevant. So like actually understanding how, you know, it's, it's not additive. Um, we're allowed to be something else besides our background. Great. How can food media do a better job diversifying beyond race, for example, socioeconomic? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, in some like pretty pretty disappointing editorial meetings in which suddenly with the pandemic happening we need to like be budget conscious but i find it really gross that that is not already the norm um and i think like one thing that I think about a lot is just the importance of intersectionality and the different kinds of diversity that exist. And yes, while race and gender might be like the most visible forms of diversity, I think a lot about, you know, within the publications that I write for, the lack of representation when it comes to everything from uh, abilities, body type, Ge geography, um, socioeconomic status, all of these things sort of inform the, the way you eat, how you eat. And I think that they're just like, even, even though they're not as visible, they, they are so, so, so important. Um, and I think like so many magazines sort of exist on this like, premise of elitism like I was in a meeting with an editor who was like of course our readers have heard of sweet green like we serve the kind of reader who's like knows what sweet green is but it's like a very specific person who knows what sweet green is um who has a sweet green nearby where they live and <laughs> I, 
I think we're a long, a long, there's a lot of work to be done in the food media space with regards to intersectionality. I'll say that much. I really like that question because I think, you know, thinking as a hiring manager who's hired, you know, many people, I think the one thing that I never look at is education. I think that should just go away. Um, and I think you should be looking at their clips and the interview process, um, maybe their experience, but the question is also difficult because the, the experience, the job experience is also informed by previous, um, you know, privileges and, and, and otherwise. But I think making sure that, um, you know, the application process is more kind of equitable and just flattened or something so that people are, are hired based on merit and not, you know, dumb stuff. Yeah, and addressing socio socioeconomic in particular, um, I think it's a, it's a well-known fact that media, including food media, um, typically does not pay well. Um, you know, the, there are like unpaid or very low paid internships um, starting salaries may be in the range of like 30,000, 40,000 in like New York or an expensive city like that. Um, like freelance rates, you know, you'll be very, very lucky if you'll find like $1 word, uh, was anywhere now, um, unless you're, you know, maybe a big name. Um, so again, the idea of like putting your money where your mouth is, like if you're really dedicated to, um, you know, expanding diversity within an organization, um, which is like socioeconomic also intersects with race a lot of times. Um, like really making sure that you're paying people livable wages, um, you're increasing freelance rates or like being more transparent about your rates and being kind of more um, equitable about rates across the board. Um, but yeah, this is a, a, like it's a time when all the these companies are, you know, kind of like committing to slashing their budgets even more. So this is um, a really difficult sort of economic reality at the moment. Okay, this is a question about uh, grappling with food industry icons who have basically built their careers on appropriation. For example, Asian cuisine like Andy Ricker. Um, what do you think about these white cooks who maybe are real champions of a cuisine, but by default are also have have very much acted as white gatekeepers. No one wants to answer. <laughs> it's okay. I, 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 I have some thoughts. Okay. Um, I because actually I just wrote uh, I I just read um Mayuk Sen just wrote a, a thing about Diana Kennedy, um, a documentary um, for the Washington Post. I think that came out today so I'm just reading that and thinking about that before this panel actually um I think the thing with these you know different icons or figures um who are white or may not come from that specific cuisine that they're so known for it's not so much again that they themselves like are dedicated to the cuisine and the craft um but it, like this in an ideal world everyone would be able to to cook what they want um you know, express our interest in what they want, but we don't live in an ideal world. Like this all happens. This does not happen like inside a vacuum. Like for every like Andy Ricker, Diana D Ken Diana Kennedy, like how many um, you know, people from that cuisine, like how many Thai Thai chefs or Mexican chefs or, or writers did not get the same opportunity and continue to not get that same opportunity. Um so I think that is like the the real sort of like rub with these kind of people and like with the idea of cultural appropriation in general, um, just like the the sort of like dealing with again the the reality of like scarcity or like once we have like one iconic uh, like Rick Bayless like there's really no room for other people um, who are you know people of color behind them, um, so I think I mean. I, I know like some of these people I, I'm sure have, uh, but really it's like, if you, if they were so fortunate to get this chance on this platform, like what are they doing after that? And what are they doing to help people um, come up behind them, to help people who are from those cultures and those communities? Um, are they just like, you know, skimming from it and profiting off it? Or are they actually like investing in the community that they built their entire career on? I also think that like one small thing like we can do as writers and people and editors is to not necessarily default to those people as our sources 
um, especially when people already have huge platforms, like, does it really help them to necessarily give them another, you know, to use them as a source again? I think that as like, as a writer, I think we sort of have a duty to also just sort of diversify who we're sourcing and who we want to talk to. And even if that means taking a little more effort than like choosing the most obvious person who might, who very likely is a white chef. Thank you. All right, this question is from Afton, a white recipe developer and food writer. Are there specific things I can do to be a better ally to my black indigenous POC colleagues and make sure their voices are amplified, better represented within my organization? Like, I mean, so, so much. Uh, you have so much power or more power then you know your you have I'm sure you 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 have the ability for your colleagues to like listen to you and lend credibility to what you're saying. I think like the more white people can stand up again when they like see something happening when they read something that reads off to them, um, sort of dedicating themselves to like pitching BIPOC writers, BIPOC centered stories the more white people who can commit to doing that work and like taking on that labor, like the better this world, this world will be. I mean, like it just, just the more that you can, I think the more that white people are able to think outside of themselves and their own experiences, because remember that's something that BIPOC people have been forced to do their entire lives. So I think, the more that you can think outside of yourself, the, the better the food media world will be. I also would say that I think it's really valuable for a white, you know, what if you're an editor, writer, if you see something that you think is tokenizing or problematic and you're the one who leads the charge about it versus a person of color, yep. um, I think that lends as you were saying, Priya, a lot of credibility. And also, even if you're like, especially if you're calling in, many times your, the, your higher up is probably going to be white. And there is a difference in how they're going to interact with you versus how they're going to interact with me if we're raising the same issue. Um, because there's concerns about not saying the right thing or saying the wrong word or whatever that I think that you can use to your advantage. Thank you. Okay, um, Sean asks, how can we challenge Asians and Asian Americans to not gatekeep their cuisine while still doing due diligence and respecting culture? Jenny Dorsey, why don't you kick us off? Um, <laughs> I'm assuming if this means like uh, not allowing more stories from that same, like if I don't want more, Chinese stories, if I'm like an editor because I'm worried about there's too many Chinese stories on the platform. Um, so this is something that did come up uh, in one of the salons that we had hosted of uh, an Asian American person saying no to a different um, person of color saying like, oh, we have too much of whatever that cuisine is. Um, so I think as Asian Americans, we should be cognizant of within the Asian American spectrum, there's a lot of underrepresented Asian American cuisines that we need to be champions of. That doesn't mean we should, I, like if I were the Chinese American editor, I don't need to push down Chinese American stories, but also recognize like, do we have an Indonesian story? Like have we talked about that recently? Um, I think maybe giving more space and holding space for those people um, to have their opinion. And I don't know if numbers like, numbers or statistics is helpful, but looking at the breakdown of your stories between East Asian, and Southeast Asian, and South Asian, what really does that look like? Do you have a natural tendency towards certain writers? Um, yeah. It, the answer to this seems like it goes back to earlier in the conversation when we're talking about, I think Priya said it, but the pressure to represent your culture or your cuisine. And the more we all kind of dismantle this internalized, um, I want to say like homophobia, but um, that's just internalized whatever the word for, for races. Um, I think uh, the more, the better off it will be for, for everyone, just acknowledging that your cuisine, your family's cuisine um, is, uh, is, is diverse, is multiple, um, is part of, it's like one droplet in, in a larger thing, the same way that white people get to say that their food is. Um, and so I think just 
acknowledge just treating your story as a singular thing. I think that will, you know, in the narrative, I think that will help in the long run. Thanks. Okay, next question um, for anyone. In your experience, how do you feel about the way that tokenization of your experiences stopped, stops people from understanding how vast, nuanced, and regional cuisines are? How does this put pressure on you as writers and recipe developers? Someone mentioned that they, they edit themselves even before sometimes they turn in their, their stories, right? Yeah, I mean, I oh, go ahead, Jenny, go ahead. I was gonna say there was like, definitely instances where I wanted to use stronger language in some of my, um, uh, some of my uh, pieces uh, about violence, especially violence against POC uh, that didn't work out, you know, very well. So I think there's also like a, a, a flattening of how POCs might have perceived said violence um, in their history as like not that bad because we always constantly portray it as not that bad even though it's horrible and it's genocide. Um, so yeah. Did you want to add anything, Priya? You're muted. No, no I <laughs> so I mean, I just wanted to sort of reiterate that like, we as writers need to need to understand that like we are one person and one experience. And I, but I think also like consumers and viewers need to like not place, like the burden for representation should not fall on the shoulders of a single person. I certainly think that the people at the platform have a responsibility and a duty to open the gate for other voices within their community and outside of their community. But it is, simply an impossible task for one person to represent a multiplicity of experiences. And I think it's just, I, I try very hard to like remind myself that, to remind other people that, but I mean, it's, it's very hard. Like this is just like simply a barrier that many white communities, most white communities I feel just don't, don't even have to worry about. Um, and it's and it's hard and it's something that I think about all the time. Thanks. We have time for about two more questions. So apologies in advance if we don't get to yours. So sorry. Uh, this question is from Dahlia. What kind of language do you suggest we use to incite action from those that keep the keys in food media to showcase more POC when we reach out to them with our food pitches and recipes? You have a thought, Bettina? I mean, I guess, I guess one thing I think of is like, for example, I've been noticing sort of more people doing recently, like I reached out to a source for a story that wasn't about food. And she said, you know, I, I would love to be a source, but for example, but like, I would only like to be a source if you're also going to reach out to like uh, black artists who are, you know, in this sphere. And I think that's like something that other people can do. I've noticed, I saw a tweet recently about some restaurant, a white restaurant owner sort of said that to a reporter also saying that like, we will be in this piece, but also only if you reach out to other restaurants because we're speaking from a point of privilege. And I feel like that's something that more people can do to show, you know, to show that they aren't just gonna be complicit in another article that only talks to white male chefs, for example. Um, I think there are, I feel like that's one step that more people can potentially take. You're talking, Delia, though, about like reaching out to an editor, right? Um, I feel like one important thing is to kind of do the work for them, which it should be the editor's job to know, but um, providing context about the site's coverage. And um, that's always like one way to, to talk about, um, you know, a, a, a missed um, information gap. That doesn't, yeah, you know. I also feel like sometimes I get. I mean, I'm not an assigning editor, but sometimes I feel like I get PR pitches or ideas where it's a very well-intentioned writer who wants to spotlight a BIPOC voice. However, within the pitch, the point of the story seems to be like, this chef is black. 
they don't seem to like the pitch does not treat that person as a three-dimensional human being and I think like the point of the story cannot be that this person is a person of color we need to we, we need to treat sub profile like all subject profiles the same and sort of hold hold them to the sort of the same standard of like finding the angle and finding the nuance beyond just the color of their skin or the fact that they are a, a black chef. And I just, I think that, that a lot of that work, I think a lot of editors right now are really excited about wanting to feature more voices, especially black voices. And I imagine that you will probably see a lot of those stories that don't treat the subject with like the nuance and the dimensionality that they deserve. But I think as writers, we, we need to sort of do, do that work and think a little bit harder about why are we pitching this person? Why are we pitching them now? What is my angle here? And is it, does it all hinge on them being a, a black chef? Is that, am I pushing myself harder as a journalist? Okay, I'm gonna take one more question. And Priya, if you need to pop off, it's totally fine. Okay, um, there are a lot of listening and learning statements emerging from numerous companies right now that seem to be more about documenting corporate responsibility rather than actually addressing complicity and enacting change. How would you pitch a corporate board to change their approach to food media in a way that wasn't about cultural politics or about it being the right thing to do, uh, but something that would speak to their bottom line? Um, something that I learned um, from a, a colleague was that she used to work at BuzzFeed Tasty, um, I believe, and they were doing a demographic uh, just analysis on who was actually watching their Tasty videos. And shockingly, like the assumption I think that we usually hold is like it's like white people in America, but they saw that there was a large minority um, of people from India, like the, the subcontinent, um, that were watching their videos and so then why would you explain things like not because they already know that so like it totally shifted their viewpoint of how they're approaching their content in general and I think like having things like that would be useful because how many times do we actually question what our demographic is using data to back it up and also using the words audience growth that will make everyone just just their pants yeah. Okay, um, I guess it's time to wrap up. So sorry if we didn't get to your questions. Thank you, they were all really, really thoughtful questions and we appreciate it. I'm sorry that there's not more time, um, but hopefully we can continue the conversation on Twitter um, and come and reconvene at some point. And you can always email us at the museum at info at mofed.org and we'll do your best to direct your questions to the right place. I'm also gonna follow up with everyone tomorrow with an email. Um, just include some information that came up in the talk tonight and of course include uh, some information about all the wonderful panelists that we heard from. And just as a reminder, this was recorded, so we'll be posting it on our website. So if you want to come back and revisit it, it'll be up tomorrow and you can also share with your friends. And again, just want to please encourage you to sign up for our newsletter at mofat.org um, so you know all the upcoming programs next week's the final talk in our takeout series.